protein uh, which, we started to, which, which we started to work on over 20 years ago. And, and so I'll bring you through what we did 20 years ago and how we sort of have followed. As the field has changed, we've changed the way we've studied this molecule and um, bring it to the stage where we are today. So I'll talk about some of the experiments we've been doing over the last few weeks. So these are experiments we started with on the A2 genes 25 years ago, and you'll hear about what, we were, what we've done in the last 25 years. And, and it, it, it turns out to be, I think, one of the most interesting molecules in Lushmania. So you, and, and you'll see from, from some of the data that these really are quite, quite interesting proteins. And it really relates to trying to understand virulence. You know, what makes a parasite capable of surviving inside a host and causing disease inside the host? So this was <coughs> the question that we addressed. And this was when I first started to work on Lashmania. And uh, so we had the promastigote form, and then we had the amastigote form. And the obvious question we had at the time was, what's the differences in genes which are expressed here than here? We still ask that same question, but we asked that 25 years ago. And I say, so can we identify genes expressed here but not here. And we didn't have the tools that we have now to do that. So we, we weren't able to follow uh, in any of the, 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 the wonderful approaches we have now. So we, uh, we did find one. And, <coughs> and, and just briefly, the way it was done is that um, we, we made a library from amastigotes. We made a cDNA library from amastigotes. And we plated them out on a large plate, lambda phages. And then we labeled cDNA with P32 from amastigotes and promastigotes, and we hybridized it to that, and we looked for differences in the pattern. So this was a, it's a very old-fashioned fashion way of looking at differences in gene expression. But in fact, it was quite effective. Nobody would do that today. I mean, it was, it was just, that's, that's old school. But we did find this gene we call A2. And, and this is a northern blot where you look at levels of RNA. And you can see that this is a level of RNA expressed in the amastigote versus promastigote. <coughs> this is not a two-fold difference, right? This is a huge difference. And that this technique only really sees big differences. So when you see this kind of difference, then you know there's a real change in expression. And if you look at, again, at RNA levels, this is promastigotes. These are uninfected macrophages. And then when you have infected macrophages, you can see the gene is turned on. So this is a parasite gene that's turned on only when it's inside the macrophage, but not inside the promastigote. Okay, so this is, this is really what started us on the path to start to study this gene. And we sequenced it, and we found that uh, it had this green area here, which was a leader sequence. So it's somehow it's directing the protein to go somewhere. We're not sure where yet. Well, we have some ideas, but it's directing it to go somewhere. And if you sequence the gene, um, this is, it has this 10 amino acid which is repeated many times. So there are many copies. So it's one of these repeat genes. And, and again, this is one of the ones that makes it difficult to do genome analysis because this is where you have those areas where you have gaps because of this, uh, uh, this repeat sequence. So Peter's been very good at, at stitching it together though. So we've been able to, over the years, collaborate with him to, to figure this out. And you can see the one that this paper was published in 1994. So this is shows you how far back this goes when we started. This. I, I think most of you probably weren't even born at that time. <laughs> <coughs> and, and then we, we did some genome analysis uh, to find out. And the A2 genes are white blocks here. And it turns out there are many of the genes. So there are many copies of this gene. Um, and they're interdispersed by another gene here, these black genes we call A2-REL because it's, it's close to the A2 genes. And it, of course, the, the chromosomes are diploid. But even on each chromosome, there are differences in the, in the number of A2 genes. On this, on this chromosome, we have more A2 genes than on this one. And the other thing you'll notice is that some of these blocks are bigger than these other blocks. And that's not a mistake in, in, in making the slide. It just turns out that there are more repeats here, so the gene is longer than in these ones. So some genes have more repeats, and some have fewer repeats. And there's a lot of these genes. So we're starting to move through now to, from, to 2000, 2003. So we're starting to move forward in time. And we also developed antibodies against this, these proteins. We have very good monoclonal antibodies, which react against that repeat unit. And when you do a, a Western blot, 
you can see that there's very low expression in the promastigotes, but in the exenic amastigotes, you see many bands. And that's because there are a number of genes. These genes have more repeats than these ones. And so there, each, each one of these are A2, and it's just a number of those repeat amino acids. And again, uh, this, it's striking to see how tightly this thing is, is really expressed in amastigotes. So it doesn't seem to be important to, for the sandfly stage, but it's, we think it, it is important for the, uh, to survive in the humans, um, for Donovanic to survive in humans. And if we do uh, immunofluorescence, uh, so we stain for A2 here, and we've, we've looked at various parts within the cell, and, and it seems to co-localize with another protein called BIP, BIP is something which is present in the endoplasmic reticulum. It's a, it's a transporter protein that moves things into the endoplasmic reticulum. And so we have pretty good evidence that it's, it's probably in the ER, but it, it could be in other parts of the cell as well. So you try to figure out where it is in the cell, and that, that's one way of trying to understand what it does. Maybe by understanding where it is, that helps you understand what it's doing. So we're getting closer, 2010 now. You see, we haven't made that much progress in that from 1994 to 2010. But this is an interesting slide, and this goes back to some of the things that Paul was saying. We also looked at where it's expressed inside an infected macrophage. And so this is a, a macrophage, and you have a lot of amastigotes here. So I'm always amazed at how many amastigotes you can put into a macrophage. But we were surprised that not all of the amastigotes are expressing A2. Some of them express at higher levels, and then some of them express at lower levels. And this indicates that, to us anyway, that not all of these amastigotes are in the same kind of environment. Um, and from what we know is that this gene is turned on. Whenever the parasite is under stress, it turns on this gene. So it's not only uh, amastigote specific, but if you stress it, for example, if you put it in the heat conditions, uh, this gene is turned on. So these amastigotes are under different under different conditions within the same uh, macrophage because these may be under more stress, so they're expressing more A2 uh, than these ones, which may be under less stress or maybe under a different type of environment. Uh, so you have this heterogeneity in the expression. And you won't see that on a Western blot, of course. On the Western blot, you're just looking at all of them at the same time. Uh, we know that it's obviously expressed in, in, in humans because uh, um, uh, a lot of people actually have antibodies against A2, and so we're just looking at, uh, L.A.D. Godet looked at this uh, antibody titers against A2, and, and almost 90% of people, or 80 to 90% of people, do develop antibodies against A2. So it is immunogenic as well uh, in, in people who are infected uh, in visceral leishmaniasis patients. And so we've done the uh, knockouts, uh, doing the traditional way of, of targeting genes. And this is a southern blot here. This isn't proteins, these are DNA. This again is a very old fashioned technique where you take the DNA, you, run it, you cut it with a restriction enzyme, you run it on a gel, and then you hybridize it with the A2 probe and you get bandings. And so you see on the southern blot, you get many bands for the A2 genes. Um, and, and that are expressing the wild type, this stands for wild type parasites, and these are wild type, and you get the A2 proteins. And then if you knock out this gene by doing homologous recombination gene replacement, if you knock out this gene, you see you knock out this protein here. And in here we were able to knock out several of the genes doing homologous recombination techniques, and you can see that uh, we were able to knock out s some of the proteins here. But because it's a multi-gene family, it's very difficult to knock out all those genes using this, this kind of an approach. But nevertheless, if we were able, when we do knock out some of these, uh, these genes and we do reduce the amount of proteins, we also reduce the virulence in, in mice. So this is LDU, this is infection in, uh, in liver. And we also had some success using antisense RNA with A2 here. I'm not showing the data, but if you knock down A2 with antisense, you also reduce the virulence. So if we can knock down, if we were able to partially knock down A2, uh, and we're able to reduce the level of, of infection here. So indicating that it is required for survival in the, uh, in the mammalian host. So 
So what, what, one of the other things that was interesting, so we, 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 we originally cloned the gene from Leishmania donovani. We were more interested at the time in visceral leishmaniasis. But we wanted to see if this gene was also present in other strains of Leishmania. And this was a, uh, a karyotype analysis where you, you do a blot on, these are whole chromosome blots. And you could see that in the L. Donovani, these are different strains of L. Donovani. We see the gene is present. It is also present in L. Mexicana here as well. Uh, but the gene was absent in Leishmania tropica and Leishmania major. Okay, so um, it wasn't present in, in all of the, the, the strains, particularly these ones which are involved in cutaneous Leishmaniasis in old world. And so we looked at what's going on in these parasites, why it doesn't have the gene in, in Tropica and Major. Uh, and as you know, visceral leishmaniasis is caused by Donovani, cutaneous is by Major. So we were interested to see if, uh, what's happening in A2 in the, in the L Major parasite. And it was actually very interesting. L Major actually has the gene, but what it's done, it's, it's lost all of these repeat units. So you have in Leishmania Donovani, all of the genes have a lot of repeat units here. So these have, each one of these is the repeat unit. But L major, for some reason, it seems to have collapsed down these repeats. So it's, it's maybe over time, it just didn't want them anymore. So repeats tend to either open up or close. They're a little bit more flexible within the genome. So it seems to have gone down and there's virtually no repeats left, but it did maintain the, the, the in fact, even the leader sequence. L major even has the leader sequence uh, and it's got the same five prime untranslated region, three prime untranslated. It's got everything except the repeat units. And that's true for all of the genes within L major. So for, there was some pressure for L major at some point to lose this uh, gene. Or I guess you could argue there was pressure at some point to expand this gene in L. Donovani. So this is still a mystery to us. But we, uh, we wanted to see uh, what would happen if we put A2 back into L major? L, at one time, L major used to have it, or we think it used to have it. So we, 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 we have a plasmid vector, and we transfected A2 into L major. And you see this is expression. It was, it, it was interesting in L major. It's also, even though it's on expressed from this plasmid, there was still tight regulation. This is L major promastigotes. This is L major amastigotes. Uh, with the plasmid expressing A2, and it's still tightly regulated. So L major still was able to tightly regulate it, just like the, the L Donovani. And uh, what we found is that when, when, when L major had the A2 gene, you did get an increase in infection as well. You see, we had about a fourfold increase, and this was repeated many times. So there, there wa it was able to enable L major to survive better in the spleen. Not a huge difference, but there was a difference, a, a clear increase here. What was remarkable, though, is when we looked at the spleen, it really increased the, the size of the spleen. We could always tell the L major that had the uh, A2 because it always provided much larger spleens, and we still don't understand this. Maybe Paul could help us with this one, but it, it, it really did have this big effect on the spleen. If A2 was there, the spleens were larger as well. So we, we were able to see a phenotype here. Um, so so th this was consistent with the fact that if you have a, a Donovani infection, splenomegria is one of the things that's, that's involved in, or one of the things that you actually see in Leishmania Donovani infections. And, and certainly A2 seemed to be able to increase the level of the spleen in these uh, in these, in these uh, L major uh, as well. Um, so this was a, a, an experiment where we, we were able to partially knock down A2 uh, using antisense. If you leave a longer exposure, you, you can see that there is still some A2 here, but antisense was able to knock down A2. And I think it works with A2 because they have that repeat unit and it allows things to hybridize better. But if we took L. Donovani and we down-modulated A2 here, one of the things we found is that um, L. Donovani wasn't able to survive as well in heat conditions. So uh, Donovani, one of the difference between Donovani and Major is Donovani has to be able to survive fever because people who have Donovani infections have high fever. Uh, and if you knock out A2, you can see if you incubate the parasite at 40 degrees uh, with A2, 
you have much more survival than in the absence of A2. So we think that A2 is allowing the parasite to survive in the higher levels in fever, which is typical of, of, of a Donovani infection. You don't have to deal with fever so much in an L major infection, but you do have to deal with fever in a Donovani infection. And this was an interesting result, again, when we put A2 into L major. This is the temperature experiment that I'm talking about. And uh, this is a uh, Alomar blue assay. And um, the pink cell, if the, if the, if the cells are, are alive, it produces pink inside the media. If the cells die, it produces this blue in the media. And so you see L major, if you cu culture L major at 26 degrees, it's pink. But if you put L major at 40 degrees, it doesn't like it and they die. So L major dies at 40 degrees, uh, but it survives at 26 degrees. Donovani, which is the visceral parasite, you can see it survives nicely at 26 degrees, but if you put Donovani at 40 degrees, it also survives because Donovani has to survive in a fever. So it, it survives very well uh, at the higher temperature. And if you put A2 into L major, you get this intermediate here. Uh, so you could, this shows in a in, in sort of visual way that it really temperature is, is an important aspect of this and it enables the parasite to survive at higher temperatures. So uh, that was uh, some of the basic work and, and um, fast forward, this is now we're, we're talking, uh, um, I guess about four or five years ago, uh, this is, we, we weren't interested in, where we weren't following up on A2, we were following up on something else that we were we, uh, at the time and that was in Sri Lanka. We started to study with uh, uh, a colleague in Sri Lanka, uh, Shalinda Ranasinghe, and um, she contacted, this is at the time when I was at the WHO, and she, she contacted us and she said, well, we have a lot of cutaneous leishmaniasis in Sri Lanka, and it seems to be coming from Leishmania Donovani, and we'd like to start studying it. Can you provide us with some DNA that we can do PCR analysis? So I sent her some DNA for, to, so she could start doing PCR, but I asked her, can you also send us the parasite? This really looks like a very interesting parasite. And she was able to culture the parasite and send it to our laboratory in, in Montreal. And, um, and this is just typically what you would find. This was an area of Sri Lanka where there was a lot of cutaneous leishmaniasis. These are just the orange dots here. So this is a, a, this area here where you had a number of cutaneous leishmaniasis occurring. And, but you had very few visceral leishmaniasis, but there was one visceral leishmaniasis case uh, here as well. So you, it's an area where you have uh, a lot of cutaneous, very little visceral, but both of them seem to be caused by the same parasite, Leishmania donovani. So we, uh, we were interested in, in, in uh, obtaining this parasite. So we, 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 uh, Sri Linda sent us the parasite from, this is the patient that she isolated the visceral parasite from. This is the patient that she isolated the cutaneous parasite from. We put them in culture and we had them growing as promastigotes in culture. So we have these two dishes now from Sri Lanka. One from a cutaneous patient, one from a visceral patient, right? They both are L. Donovani, right? So what's the next experiment you would do with those? So this is the question of, I'm asking to the... You challenge them to insert challenges? Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, pretty good answer. What else would you do? What else would... Huh? Well, well, we're not talking about A2 here. We weren't too interested in it. We were... I mean, yeah, we just talked about A2. Yeah, infect the mice. Yeah, infect the mice, yeah. M many people, and in fact, when I, when I ask this question to other students in, 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 in lectures, they say, oh, you have to sequence the genome. I say, no, you don't have to sequence the genome. You have to do first biological experiments and then sequence the genome. So. So your, your answer is the one that, w that we took, is we put them in mice, just to see what would happen if you put them in mice. And I think this was, to me, the most interesting result that I had seen in many years. Um, when, we put, when we put it in mice, in the cutaneous one, in the, if we looked in the liver and, and spleen, there was very little parasite. There was some, but very small amount of parasite. It really wasn't able to survive well in the liver and spleen in mice. Whereas from the visceral parasite, from the visceral patient, you had similar to as what you would get in India. You had good levels of infection, and it re you really had uh, typical of a Donovani capable of surviving in the liver and spleen in the mouth. So the phenotype in the mouse was similar to the phenotype in the humans here. So this was something that I 
that was really interesting to me. And at that time, and at that time, uh, uh, Jesus. Did it cause the pad in my? Uh, we tried. In fact, it did cause swelling in the foot pad. There was some swelling in the foot pad, but went down. Not a, not typical, but there w there was clearly a swelling that was occurring in the foot pad. Can I also ask also the type of uh, CL that you see in patients? Yeah. It's not a, a open lesion. No, you also get open lesions you as well. Yeah, yeah. In the mouse yeah, yeah. You don't get open lesions in the mouse model. It's not like an L major infection in the mouse model. Um, so at this point, I contacted Peter and I said, Peter, we have these interesting parasites and you know, we need to look at the genome. And so we started to collaborate at that point. Uh, and, and I won't go into all of the data that was published in, in 2014, but I'll just give you the, the sort of summary because I want to move on to a, a, a focus more on A2, is that uh, you, you, you're aware of, of indeed that uh, the size of the genome and uh, and the, the different strains of the genome. I think the thing that, that was most interesting to me is that we did not see major changes in the genome, okay? I thought that we would see a lot of genes either amplified or deleted and rearranged. I thought we would see big differences in, within the genome, but there are very subtle differences. Most of the, most of the differences are at the level of uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. There was no real pseudogenes that we could identify, although we, maybe we need to go back and look a little bit more carefully, we have a little bit better tools now. The tools have gotten better even, even since 2014, and we're starting to do that. But there was nothing obvious by sequencing the genome at that time. So we said, well, there's, well th there were two interesting things, though, that we did see. Of course, we did see a difference in A2, which we were quite <coughs> pleased about. And, you know, we, we, we definitely interested in looking at A2. The other one is this other gene, RAGC, which I won't talk about. but there was, this, there was a polymorphism in RAG-C that also seemed to be uh, highly, highly relevant. And we haven't really followed up on that, but that's something we're doing in the lab now. But I'd like to talk about uh, A2. And Peter showed some of this uh, in his talk as well. Uh, when we sequenced across the A2 region of the genome, and we had here the red is the uh, visceral parasite, green is the cutaneous parasite. In the visceral parasite, we always had more A2 sequences than in the... Uh, cutaneous parasite. So there seem to be more genes present within the A2 than the, uh, in the visceral parasite. And then when we did the Western blot, we see the visceral parasite had at least five genes here, and they seem to be expressed even at higher levels. And the cutaneous parasite had much lower levels of A2. So there seem, maybe it's going in the same direction as L major, we're starting to lose those A2 genes because it's, it's a cutaneous parasite. Um, and then uh, if we were to reintroduce A2, so this is the cutaneous parasite, and we put the A2 back into this one. So it has the endogenous proteins, but we added a, a, another one. So you had, instead of three, it's ad added four. And just by adding this extra A2 here, we were able to increase the level of infection uh, in the liver and spleen of these mice as well. So you can go from this level to this level. So I think there was a the parasite needs a threshold amount of A2 in order to survive in the visceral organ. So, so this, this, this was able to follow through and, and see that A2 seems to be lo lost or it's being reduced in this cutaneous parasite. Okay. Um, so the model we have of A2 at this point is that Donovani has A2, L major doesn't have A2, and that allows it to survive at higher temperatures because the fever... Uh, I also, we have some evidence that in, it, it allows survival in, the, in, in stress. And other forms of stress are like nitric oxide or reactive oxygen species. And this allows it to survive in the internal organs causing visceral leishmaniasis. If you don't have the A2, um, it, it's much, it reduces its ability to survive in visceral organs. Uh, and that leads to the uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. So this is really... Uh, uh, consistent with A2 being one of these important virulence factors. So um, some of the ongoing questions we have is why the cutaneous has lost its virulence. Well, so what happened in Sri Lanka? Why did Donovani go from a visceral parasite to a cutaneous parasite? W what was the pressure to do that? So this is a really interesting biological question. 
One thing is that it may have shifted to an animal reservoir. So I think that's one thing that needs to be followed up on because most of the cutaneous parasites that cause cutaneous leishmaniasis in people, people aren't a main reservoir, it's animals. So I think when it goes from an animal to a human, it's not really very well adapted and it stays on the skin. It's not able to survive in the visceral organ. So there may be an animal reservoir here. The other thing is, why are there so few cases of visceral leishmaniasis? The parasite is there. there is the visceral form of the disease, L. Donovani, is in Sri Lanka, but there's very few cases. There's a lot of cases of cutaneous. So one of the things we think is going on is that people who are exposed to the cutaneous parasite become immunized, and that protects them against the visceral parasite. So there's a sort of a natural immunization that's going on there. And a uh, student, uh, Laura, in my lab actually looked at this and, and she immunized mice with the cutaneous parasite and then challenged with the visceral and found that she could pro see protection there. So there may be a natural form of uh, immunization going on there. And this is one of the things we're following up on because this may help us to understand and how to make a vaccine. And then we're, we're continuing to study uh, the function of A2 and RAG-C. So uh, that's where we are now. I'd like to uh, switch and, and look at a different aspect, and this will bring us back to A2 in a moment. But uh, what I'd like to talk about uh, now is, is a, an approach, a new approach for doing studies in eukaryotic cells called CRISPR-Cas. I think many of you have probably heard of CRISPR-Cas. It's a way of doing genome editing. And, uh, CRISPR-Cas originates in bacteria, and it's a way of, for bacteria to protect itself against uh, viral infections, DNA virus or phage viruses. And the way CRISPR-Cas works is that there, there's two aspects to it. Cas here is a nuclease, so it's nuclease and it cuts DNA in half. So it makes a cut in DNA in half, and, the and it has a guide RNA which, which directs the, D uh, the nuclease to cut in specific places. So these bacterial genomes have guide RNA which are specific to invading viruses. So when a virus enters the bacteria, the guide RNA identifies that bacterial DNA, binds to it, and it directs the enzyme uh, Cas to cut it. So this way it's when, a, when the phage infects the bacteria, the bacteria cuts the phage DNA and protects it. So this is a protection mechanism that bacteria have. And several years ago, uh, it was adapted so that this could be used to cut DNA from any cell type. So it could be used for, and, and it's now uh, commonly used for almost all cell types. So this is the, the nuclease here, which is in purple, and the guide RNA is here, which binds to the DNA. Once the guide RNA binds DNA, the nuclease cuts it, and you now have uh, a specific cut within the DNA at a specific site, which is complementary to this, this guide RNA here. So a couple years ago, I went to, well, I saw a talk on this, and I went to my, when we in my lab, who's probably the best Leishmania molecular biologist I know, and I said, you know, we should try to get this to work in Leishmania, and I just showed him some papers, we talked about it, and this was just before the Christmas holidays, and he, and he looked at it, and he says, well, you know, it's not going to really work in Leishmania, and I'll, I'll talk about why in a moment. So it's, it's, I don't think it's worth pursuing. Then he came back after the holidays, and he said, you know what, I think I know how to make it work. So I said, okay, you know, go for it and, and, and let's see where we go. And so this was, it's been a lot of fun over the last couple years, or the last two years uh, in, in uh, how it works. So, so, uh, so what when we did in my lab is he developed two plasmid vectors. One of them expresses the Cas9. So this is the, the purple one here, expresses the nuclease. And, and the other one expresses a guide RNA here. And this was the problem that in, in Leishmania is that there was no way of expressing an RNA of this size. It's about 25 base pairs in length, this guide RNA. And in another system, they use tRNA, so tRNAs can, uh, t, tRNA uh, promoter, which you, know, you can clearly define the size of the guide RNA. We didn't have that tool in Leishmania. Um, so we needed a way of, of expressing these small guide RNAs in Leishmania. So what when we did is, is he put a, um, a ribozyme at the end. A ribozyme is a self-splicing RNA. So this is from a hepatitis virus. When it expresses the RNA, the RNA cuts itself. You don't need a, um, an enzyme to cut it. So 
using this, this ribozyme here, he was able to express guide RNAs at the correct size. The other thing is we didn't have a tRNA promoter. All of the other uh, CRISPR-Cas work has always been done with a tRNA promoter. They weren't really well characterized in Leshmia. As you know, promoters aren't very well characterized. But he took uh, a ribosomal RNA promoter and said, that you'll try and get this to work using the ribosomal RNA promoter. So this was, the, this was really the novel part here. And Cas was easy to express. We just use A2 sequences. A2, uh, five prime and three prime UTRs are very good for expressing genes at high levels in, in amastigos. So he took these two plasmids and co-transfect, one of them was selected with hydro, one of them was selected with neo, and transfected them into uh, Leishmania. Uh, and that's, this isn't really the one I wanted to show next, but just to follow on in that, the next thing he did uh, is he's, we've actually combined these into one vector. So initially you had to have two vectors, one expressing Cas9, the other one expressing guide RNA. This is how the original experiments were done. But he's actually now combined them into a single vector. So we now have, have one plasmid that you can just put in your guide RNA and the Cas is here. So it's actually simplified this even more. So if you want to try this, you just need to use one plasmid instead of two now. So what happens when you cut uh, DNA uh, in a eukaryotic cell? So this is a CRISPR-Cas system. It cuts the DNA here. There's two major ways in which DNA is repaired in eukaryotic cell. Uh, one of them is, is this one, non-homologous end joining, where it just, uh, you don't need any homologous recombination here. It just joins these ends. But when it does it, you have deletions and insertions, and then you have mutation of the gene. And this is largely how uh, the, the, the system is used to mutate genes it, through non-homologous end joining. The other way in which DNA is repaired is through homologous re ways, and that uses the other chromosome as a, as, a, as a guide to repair the DNA here. So this is the donor chromosome, and here you repair the cut here. And this results in no mutation. So if you have this, the result of repairing with homologous, because you're using the same sequence on the other chromosome, is that you don't have any mutations in the gene. So normally this won't cause mutations in the gene, but this will cause mutations in the gene. So this was actually another problem if you wanted to cause mutations. Leishmania doesn't have this mechanism. So you can't mutate genes this way. So Lesh and it, but it does have this mechanism, but it repairs the DNA without mutations. So you, if you do this, you're not gonna get any real um, gene disruption in Leishmania. So this was also another potential problem uh, with the system in Leishmania. Um, but what initially what when we did is, is he said, well, let's go this route. We know that it uses homologous recombination, and let's see if we could use this route to introduce another gene in here, uh, which would be a way of, of disrupting this gene. And so what he did is, is the gene he went after was the Meltifosin transporter, and I'll <coughs> talk about that in a minute, why he did that. But so he cut the Meltifosin transporter gene and transfected in uh, a GFP gene which had homologous sequences here. Uh, this was homologous here and here to try and get this GFP gene into this area here and then select for green cells. And then you wanted to see if it went in the right place and what he found is that he could integrate the GFP gene into the site that was broken here. And if you sequence across here, it was exactly where he predicted it would go, right in the Miltifosin transporter gene. Uh, and this was verified by DNA sequencing. So this was the first mechanism where we actually showed we could cut the DNA in a gene and we could insert it exactly where we wanted to using homologous, uh, the re homologous recombination approach. And this way you could disrupt the Miltifosin transporter gene. The other reason he went after the Miltifosin transporter gene is because uh, that causes resistance to Miltifosin. Miltifosin only gets into cells by this transporter protein. It has to be transported into the cell, and then it kills the cell. But if you mutate that gene, it, Miltifosin cannot be transported into the cell, and the cell survives. So it's a sort of a negative selection. The only way the cell can survive is if you mutate the gene. So the mutation of the Miltifosin transporter gene allows the parasite to survive in the presence of Miltifosin. And so these cells were also resistant to Miltifosin. And so that was a way of, you could put a selection in these cells for Miltifosin 
and the surviving cells had to have loss of this gene. And these were all green cells as well. So the homologous recombination approach worked. This worked. Um, but we also look, wanted to find out um, what, if, if we could do this, uh, if, if this mechanism would work here, even though according to the publications, there was no, no way of doing the non-homologous end join. So we looked at parasites without. We also got meltifosin resistance without doing this approach. Just by putting, cutting here and putting in the presence of meltifosin, we also got resistant cells as well without the homologous recombination. And when we sequenced in those, what we found was that there was homologous recombination occurring, but the homologous recombination was two adjoining sequences. So it's called microhomology uh, end joining. So you see uh, this was the guide RNA going into meltifosin. The cells were re became resistant because the gene was mutated, and they were always mutated wherever you had homologous regions. So you see you have this region was homologous to this region, this region was homologous to this region, this region homologous to this region, and you had everything in the middle deleted out, uh, but you were able to get um, repair occurring and it was due to homology, but it's, it was homology on the same chromosome rather than on the other chromosome, rather than on the, uh, um, the, the, the other chromosome. So, so, and this is called microhomology mediated end repair, which is a, a, a very, uh, a, a form of repair that is used not very much in, in higher eukaryotes. So it appears that Leishmania has changed the way it repairs DNA. It doesn't use the non-homologous mechanism, but it can use uh, this mechanism here. And this is another way in which genes can be uh, deleted. So CRISPR-Cas is working in Leishmania with, with this approach now. So um, just in summary, um, this mechanism is absent. This is the non-homologous end joining, it's absent in Leishmania, and this is the one that is present in all other eukaryotes, the normal way of, of repairing. So this is absent, so you can't use this mechanism in Leishmania. The homologous directed repair is present, and you could use that to integrate genes into any site that you want. So this one is present in Leishmania, and this one is also present in Leishmania, microhomology end joining, uh, a very rare mechanism which isn't used by many organisms, but it is used by Leishmania. So you could use this mechanism to disrupt genes in Leishmania as well. So it, it seems that Leishmania uses this mechanism instead of this mechanism. Uh, most cells use this mechanism. So what are some of the other things that you can do with this mechanism? Now that, now, now that it's been set up and it's working in Leishmania. Um, so we, th we were then able to move into our, 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 our favorite uh, gene that we've studied in other mechanisms to see, and we've never been able to knock out all of these genes using other mechanisms, homologous recombination or antisense. Uh, but when, what when we did is he, he developed two guide RNAs, one guide RNA against the leader sequence, and one guide RNA against the three prime UTR of these repeats here. So now uh, you have these guide RNAs being expressed, and it's expressing the cast gene in, in Leishmania, and we just throw the plasmids into uh, Leishmania Donovani and see what happens. And we could follow it by doing Western blots because we have the antibodies here. And so we just look at time uh, after these plasmids are, have been put into Leishmania. And you can see at zero time you have the A2. Ten days later, after you're doing the selection for the, for the plasmids, you see you're starting to have a reduction in the A2 proteins. So these two guide RNAs are going after the A2 genes within the genome. Uh, 20 days later, you see we're seeing more A2 being lost. 30 days, we're starting to see virtually no A2. At 50 days, uh, we're losing A2. So it's almost as though uh, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful system because this is, it almost, it's like this is seeing A2 has a virus within the cell. And the, the, the CRISPR-Cas sees this as a virus and it's just attacking the A2 genes. It's constantly attacking the genes. Uh, so over time, it just gets rid of all these genes. And, you don't, and this is done with a, without any selection of antibiotic resistance. Uh, so over time, you can get rid of all of the A2 genes. And we've also verified this by uh, PCR analysis as well. And if we look at levels infection in macrophages, you can see that the wild type cells, you can have uh, much better levels of infected in macrophages than A2 minus cells. And yeah? Uh, was it important to have the second 
Yeah, it was, yeah. Uh, because uh, if you put both of these here, it, it actually cuts out, it actually cuts out, so it, it sort of, you have the microhomology and joining where you, it's joining sequences here and sequences there. So you, it, it's much better to have two guide RNA. So if you want to delete a gene, you use the two guide RNAs. Um, so what else can you do with the system? Well, <coughs> we started uh, a collaboration with Hira Nakasi uh, at the FDA who's interested in developing attenuated strains as potential vaccines and he showed that if you knock out the, um, the Centrin gene, uh, the L major or L Donovani are attenuated and this could be a way of, of developing an attenuated vaccine strain. And uh, so we, we developed this vector, in fact, so this vector expresses two guide RNAs one to the five prime end of centrin, one to the three prime end of centrin, and a cast. So this is just one vector now expressing two guide RNAs, and they're separated. We have the hammerhead uh, ribozyme here and, the, and a different ribozyme here from uh, the uh, hepatitis virus. And so you could ex from this one, you could express two guide RNAs and a cast. We put that into the uh, Leishmania cells, and one guide RNA cuts here, the other guide RNA cuts here. And the other thing to increase the efficiency of this, what went, we showed is that you could transfect into these cells an oligonucleotide with homologous sequences here and here. And through the microhomology end joining, this almost acts like a piece of glue and it sticks these two ends together. So this piece, which has homologous sequences here, this piece has homologous sequence here, uh, it's sticks this end to this end, and we verified that by DNA sequencing as well. So you, you cut out the gene, and you <coughs> repair these two ends by putting in this sort of, it's almost like a Band-Aid piece of DNA, and you can just transfect that into the cell, and it, it, brings, it brings it together. Uh, and if you do the PCR analysis, you can see that the, if the wild type is there, you have the presence of the centrin gene. Without it, you don't have uh, this sequence. And we've sequenced the genome of these parasites and, 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 and it's, this gene was completely sliced out of, of uh, Leishmania major, but no other gene was touched. So the genome, it's like a virgin genome. There's no, n nothing else happening in this other than the centrin gene being removed. And this is important because traditionally you have to put in an antibiotic resistant gene and that could never be used for human trials for vaccine studies. You can't use an organism that has an antibiotic resistant gene. But this is done without antibiotic resistance and you can just cut the gene out without uh, the need of, of antibiotic resistant genes. So uh, I'll just uh, summarize uh, the work here is that CRISPR-Cas represents a, a new gene editing tool that can be used in Leishmania. And you can do a lot of things with this thing. I mean, we, we've started to explore different ways of using this. And uh, it really is, I think, going to change the way we, when we go from our genomes and, we, and we, we, we identify parts of the genome that we think are interesting, you actually have to do experiments to show that it has a phenotype. And we think that using this approach really will allow you to do experiments that you couldn't do uh, recently. So that would be useful for gene function and pathogenesis. Uh, and also, uh, this, is, this is a new way of developing attenuated strains where we can knock out virulence genes and including, uh, for example, the centrin, including, for example, A2, uh, and do it in a way that would be um, feasible in terms of regulatory approval without having to put antibiotic resistant genes here. And uh, so I just acknowledge uh, the, the, the work in, in this talk is people in my lab, particularly uh, when we, who, who really uh, is very creative and, and, and very technically skilled to, to, to make these things work. Yukshede, uh, I wanted to include him here because uh, he was a graduate student in 1994 who cloned the A2 gene many, many years ago. So uh, Uke Chere, uh still a good friend of mine, and other people that have been involved in my lab with the work that I talked about today. Um, Sherlinda Ranasinga from Sri Lanka, who's been a wonderful collaborator in, in getting the, the strains from Sri Lanka. And of course, uh, Peter and Gwathaman from, uh, well, it was SBRI at the time, but it actually changed that, it's no longer. But Peter has been really helpful to uh, try and understand what's going on in the genome of these, these strains. 
so with that, I'll uh, <coughs> stop and be happy to answer questions.